Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Have you ever been caught unprepared? Like, just not ready for something? I want to tell you a story. Um, about six years ago or so, we had listed our house for sale in, in Marysville, and uh, Carrie and Natalie were, were gone somewhere, and Matthew and Lucas and I were home. And I, had, um, I, was, I had just got done fixing Sloppy Joe's, and everything was on uh, Sloppy Joe's and green beans and french fries, I think, was on the menu that night. And we had just put the food on the table, and we were just sitting down to eat, the three of us, and they had been playing video games or something, and so they came running downstairs from where they were, and, and they came to, to sit at the table, and we were just getting ready to eat our sandwiches, and I hear something at the door. If you've ever listed your house for sale, you, you know that um, there's that little lockbox on your front door that the realtor can do the little fun thing with, and it pops the key out, and they're going to come in and show your home. Well, unbeknownst to me, there was a showing that was happening at that exact moment. We didn't get the notification that there was a showing coming. We didn't get the alert through the little app on my phone that said, please make sure your house is spotless and clean and you're vacating the premise by such and such a time. And so I hear somebody at the door as we have sloppy joes and stuff and the house wasn't at all ready. So I jump and go to the front door and I open and say, can I help you? And the realtor, shocked, the couple embarrassed, we have a showing today. I am so sorry. I did not know. If you give me 12 minutes, we'll be out of the house, and you can come and see the house, and um, just give me 12 minutes. Drive around the block, look at, look at whatever, the neighborhood, check out the schools. 12 minutes, I'll be out of here. And the, the realtor was, are you sure? Because it's obvious, looking in our front door, that we are in no way ready for a showing. And I said, promise, I'll be out in 12 minutes, it'll be fine. And so I close the door very calmly, I lock the deadbolt, and I wait until I hear the car doors shut, and it's, boys, hurry, we got to make the house ready to go. And we go flying through the house, and like, Every toy that was out was shoved under a bed. We threw video game controllers in the big toy box. The food that was on the table ended up in its pans in the dishwasher because I had no place else to put it. We had fully made Sloppy Joe sandwiches on plates shoved in the dishwasher. Just everything went everywhere. We wiped the counters and everything off. And in nine and a half minutes, everything but vacuum marks were placed on the carpet. We were ready to roll. I turned on all the lights. We jumped in the car and took off, and we sit down, and the boys go, Dad, we didn't eat. <laughs> and so I decided that we would stop at McDonald's and pick them up something to eat. Being caught unprepared or unready is not a comfortable scenario. When you're not ready, you, you panic, you, you rush, you hurry, you sometimes cut corners. Today, I want to talk to you about the readiness of one of the most popular people in the nativity story, yet a guy who had no words whatsoever. Joseph. We've talked about Mary, and we've talked about Zechariah over the past couple of weeks. Zechariah demonstrated how he was shown grace by the ability to have a child. Mary experienced the grace of God among uh, them and, and in her own life as she became pregnant. The, the angel revealed to her that she would have a baby. And while that was disturbing and disruptive to her life, I could only imagine what it must have been like to be Joseph. It says in our text from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, it, it gives us a very, very high 30,000-foot view of, of what happened in Joseph's experience. But, but let's, let's, let's kind of play this thing out for a minute. Mary and Joseph were betrothed. We talked last week, that's an engagement, more like a, it's more like a marriage than an engagement, but it's, it's kind of all of it together. They're engaged, but, they, but they're married, but they haven't actually come together as married. The ceremony hasn't happened, but it's far more than just an engagement in our culture. You see, Joseph had already paid the bride price. Whether you agree with that custom or not is irrelevant. That's what their culture did. And so he had already paid a price to the parents to buy 
Mary from her family. That price had been paid. The contractual obligation was already set in place. He was now establishing the home where they would live after they got married. He was cleaning the house and learning how to put the toilet seat down and all the things that men need to do before they get married, and we just usually don't remember. And then, and then Mary, is, Mary is home with her parents during this betrothal period, and during this time period, she's demonstrating to Joseph that she is willing to keep herself pure for him for their wedding. It's great. It's great. Like this is, it's, normally, this works really well in their culture. She lived at home, and she, they really rarely would interact with each other. It's, it's okay. It's fine. Everything's good. And so one day, one day, Mary decides she's going to come up to Joseph and say, hey, honey, um, you may want to sit down. A little flushed. Mary, are you okay? Well, yeah, I've, I've got some news. Was it good news or bad news? Well, yeah, kind of. I don't know. Well, it just depends how you take it. Can, can you just sit down? i got to tell you this. Joseph sits down, and he's panicking, and Okay, what is it, Mary? Well, honey, I'm pregnant. You, you what, what? I don't. How could you not know if this is good news, Mary? This is bad news. Because I know that the baby's not mine, and everybody's going to think that it's either mine, and I didn't follow my end of the deal by not coming near you, or they're going to think that you're some, some, like, harlot who goes out and and just has babies with anybody, or they're going to think that some guy took advantage of you and that you were hurt in some way. So, like, how can this be anything but bad news? Well, see, that's where the thing gets really cool, Joseph, because this baby isn't yours. Uh, Duh, I know. No, 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 hold on. This baby isn't yours, and it's no other person's. He's trying to figure this one out. He's going back to all of, his, all of his biology classes and anatomy classes and every other class he's ever had, and he's like, I don't understand how this thing works. If it's just you, where, how, what? Well, see, this is the cool part, Joseph, because the baby inside of me is actually given to me by the Holy Spirit. To which Joseph goes, oh, yeah, that just happened to Tom and Sue down the road. Of course that's what happened. No! You, you're lying. I mean, that had to have been what happened inside of his head. He Maybe it never came out of his mouth, but what guy in his right mind is going to believe that his wife happened to be impregnated by the Holy Spirit? Because that happens every other Thursday, right? So Joseph says, I can't do this. I just can't. And he makes up his mind. I'm just going to leave you. We're not going to make a stink of this. We're not going to talk about it. I don't know what happened or why you're doing this to me, but we're done. We can't do this anymore. I just can't put myself in this place. And the scripture tells us that he he decided to divorce her quietly so that she would not be injured, so that she would not be looked down upon by society. And so by the fact that he didn't call her out on it, in all likelihood, would have led the community to blame him for getting her pregnant and then abandoning her. He would have been the one who took the brunt of this problem. So he goes home. And I don't know how he slept that night, because I couldn't even imagine what that would be going on in his mind about how in the world does that actually even happen. But in his, in his sleep, he's, he's told by an angel Hey, Joseph, she's not lying. Really, it is exactly how she said. The Holy Spirit has come upon her. She's pregnant with God's child, and you're going to be the father, and you are going to take care of that child, and you're going to call him Jesus. And he wakes up, and they get married, and they live happily ever after. Well, kind of, sort of. They had a couple bumps, bumps along the way, like their son got murdered on a cross. That was kind of a bad day. 
But, but think about this for just a minute. How much faith did Joseph have? And what I find truly striking to me is how ready Joseph was. So what, what can we learn about our lives as Christians from how Joseph handled this problem? One, he was ready. Now, he wasn't, prepared for the, he wasn't prepared for Mary to get pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Nobody can actually prepare for that. I don't really know if anybody would ever be truly ready for that one. But he was ready. He was ready because he understood that sometimes God took you in a way you weren't ready to go. He was ready. He was ready because he was willing to do what he felt was the right thing to protect Mary in that situation. Divorce her quietly so as to not put her in any shame. You see the true character of Joseph come out. He didn't have to rush around to make a plan. He didn't have to, to knee-jerk react and, and do any of that business. He's like, I think, you know what, we'll just, we're just going to end this. It'll all be okay. He was ready. He was ready in that moment to do what he felt was the right thing based, based on a righteous living situation. I just can't do it. But God intervened. And God told him exactly how this was going to go. The second thing we learn from Joseph, not only was he ready, not only was he ready to do the right thing at the right time, but he was also close enough in a relationship with God that he understood when God moved in a different direction, he probably should pivot and follow as well. I really don't like driving in caravans of cars. I can't stand driving in a line of vehicles, especially going down the freeway, and I hate even more being the lead car in any kind of a caravan situation. I don't like being the lead car because the lead car has all the responsibility. The lead car has to make sure, A, we're going in the right direction, B, we're aware of all the other things, C, that we don't go through a, a green light that's about to turn yellow that will eventually turn red, and as, as soon as that light turns yellow, you know that the person behind you is going to slam on their brakes because they're afraid of anything other than the color green. I don't like driving in caravans because sometimes people don't follow where they're supposed to go or they're not close enough to see the directions you are supposed to be taking. But Joseph was, was so close that he understood that, that his relationship was, with God was far more than just a set of rules. It was far more than just a religion. It was actually a connectedness that meant God had the ability to go off book. I gotta be honest, what Joseph experienced was an off-script kind of a situation. Joseph didn't plan for that one. Joseph planned to marry his wife, Mary. He planned to have a family with Mary. He planned to raise children with Mary. He planned for the child to be his own child, not God's child. He planned for everything to go just a certain way, but he was close enough to God that he realized that when God turned and went off-script, he could abandon the script and follow God. Because what does it say? He woke up from this dream after seeing a vision of an angel, and he agreed. He woke up from this dream, having seen an angel, and he agreed to take Mary as his wife, knowing, knowing that she was already pregnant. We know that, that he was so close to God that he was willing to raise Jesus as his own child, even though it wasn't. He was there at the naming of Jesus. He was there as Jesus was circumcised. He was there when, when Jesus was presented in the temple. He was there to raise Jesus all the way along. And so we see Joseph's integrity to raise Jesus as his own child, even though he wasn't. I kind of think as I look at the life of Jesus throughout the New Testament, that not only did Jesus demonstrate that he was the Son of God, but he also demonstrated the integrity of Joseph in how he dealt with many of his situations in life. You see, Joseph was, was ready. He had the readiness of righteous living. He was in close relationship with God. But also what he was about to do required radical obedience. See, I think, I think a lot of times in our lives, and, and maybe not you, maybe it's just me, a lot of times in our lives we are willing to be obedient as long as it doesn't require anything to change in our lives. 
Like, I'm willing to be obedient, but that radically obedient part, I'm not really sure I like that word radical. Because radical obedience means I'm going to stand out in a crowd. Radical obedience means I'm going to look different than everybody else. Radical obedience means I'm not going to just go along with the flow when the flow is going in the wrong direction. Radical obedience means that I am in all likelihood going to get blasted for doing the thing that I know is right. Joseph was radically obedient. Joseph was radically obedient to the point where he was willing to look bad in front of the community just for doing the right thing, just for following where God would call him to go. Take her to be your wife. She's already pregnant. It's going to become obvious that this child was not his. It's going to be obvious, based on the timeline, that people are going to ask questions. Radical obedience. He was willing to put himself in a situation where his entire culture, community, friends, circles of relationships could call him into question. And he remained radically obedient. See, I think in our lives, sometimes we, we are, we're ready. We're ready, but we're not close enough to God to know when God pivots, we need to pivot. Sometimes we're ready and we're in a right relationship, but we don't have the intestinal fortitude, the guts to stand up and say, you know what, I'm going to look different. I'm willing to stand on this truth because this truth is so vital and so important that I cannot waver. But the message we learn from Joseph, the silent partner in the nativity story, not a single line did he speak that's recorded in Scripture during the nativity setting. And yet we learn so much volumes by his actions. His obedience, his radical obedience to God's call on his life spoke so loudly that he didn't even need to open his mouth. What does your life speak when it comes to the way you follow Christ? As we approach Christmas this year, as we journey through Advent, a time of preparing for the birth of Jesus, as we decorate our trees and we wrap our packages to place beneath them, as we put in all the fun flowers and decorations everywhere, we schedule our our fun parties with friends and family and neighbors and everybody else, we what happens if God calls us to stand out and look different? What happens? What happens when God says, I need you to pivot just a little bit. I need you to look just a little bit different. I need you to be willing to go someplace you don't want to go and do something you couldn't ever dream of, but know that I'm calling you in that direction, and you'll know where you're going as you listen to my voice. Are you ready in your relationship with God to be radically obedient to wherever he calls you to go? Another example of this is Jesus himself. Jesus was born into a family where he would have likely been a furniture maker. By trade, of, by, by following in the family trade, he would have done what Joseph did. He was, a, he was probably a furniture builder. He's, we call him a carpenter, but in those days it would have been a furniture builder. He was, he was a furniture builder, and so Jesus would have learned the family trade, a furniture builder. He played ball with his friends, hung out with other people his age. He grew up, didn't begin his ministry till he was roughly 30 years old. And the father says, now's the time. We see the story, and as Jesus enters into the garden, the garden of Gethsemane, during that time we call Holy Week, and he goes into the garden and he prays, Father, Father, I don't want to do this. Like, this is not, this is not really what I would like to do right now. I don't want to go to the cross. I don't want to be put on trial. I don't want to be whipped and beaten and eventually killed. I don't want any of it. Just like Joseph. Joseph says, I don't want to marry this woman who's pregnant by somebody else. I don't want to do this. And yet God says, go. And Joseph says, I will follow. 
Jesus says, this is the, or the Father says, this is the only way. And Jesus says, yet not my will, but thine be done, O Lord. What we see in the life of Jesus is a reflection of the character of his earthly father, Joseph, and a reflection of his heavenly father, God. You see, Jesus demonstrated perfectly a readiness, the right relationship with the Father, understanding that he would go where the Father called him to go, and that radical obedience that brought Jesus to a cross that wasn't his to bear, but rather was ours. His obedience, his radical obedience, caused separation from the Father, caused disillusionment by many of his followers. It caused them to dismiss him and even disown him. But it was the right thing to do because God put him in that place, ready in the right relationship to be radically obedient. We talked this morning in Bible class about how or why is it so easy to kind of bail on the things God wants us to do? Why is it so easy to not follow, to make excuses to not follow? Sometimes it comes down to radical obedience. God calls us to look different, to be different, to act different. And when we're willing to be radically obedient, we'll realize that the adversities around us demonstrate the character that God's building inside of us. And as we remain faithful through the adversities in life, we demonstrate the character of Christ through our radical obedience. This Christmas, as we learn about grace among us, we realize that God was gracious to Joseph. He graciously invited Joseph to play a key role in the story of his son's birth. God was gracious to Joseph. And he says, this is not the bus you bought the ticket for, but it's the bus I have laid out for you to live. It's the life I've got in front of you to live. And I want you to follow me. Where is God calling you to go where you will be radically obedient? Living a life that is completely off script from your predetermined path and living in bold, radical obedience to what God has in store for you. That his kingdom might be impacted tremendously through your obedience in following him. I'd like to pray for you. Gracious Father in heaven, you have given us so many wonderful examples of what it means to follow you. Men like Zechariah and Joseph. Women like Mary and the others who would follow. Father, we pray that you would show us in them the things you would have us learn. Father, remind us that as we seek to follow you in, in our words and in our actions, that even in moments of adversity, you are developing and revealing the character that you have placed inside of us. So, Father, bring us to a moment where we are ready, where we are living in a right relationship with you, close enough that when you pivot, we pivot, that when you stop, we stop, and when you go, we go. And, Father, give us the courage to be radically obedient to your call on our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.